So I teach about energy policy. I teach uh, classes sometimes in evergreen parlance, programs on international affairs, international organizations, on global development. And as I think about climate change, often what I think about are what are the important issues at the intersection of each of these phenomena. And I keep returning to one very difficult and challenging paradox. On the one hand, I believe we need to cut fossil fuel use and carbon emissions so we can basically make it less likely that the planet will warm itself to unsustainable levels. So on the other hand, we've got a real challenge because I believe that it would be unethical of us to freeze current patterns of energy use at, at the current situation where we have a globe which has vast uh, disproportionate use of energy by one set of people while others are experiencing severe energy policy. So I'm going to spend a few minutes examining this issue uh, from two contexts. The first is uh, using the idea of uh, per capita carbon emissions. So there are lots of data being collected on how much carbon each society, each country generates on a per person basis. So that gives us some interesting data to use to examine what different countries are doing, uh, how they're generating it, and what it means for their sort of profile uh, in terms of uh, future climate change. Uh, I'm also going to discuss this from the context of a series of paradoxes. And I'm thinking about paradoxes quite broadly as ethical dilemmas, statements opposed to common sense that might in fact be true, and sometimes unexpected results of uh, public policy. Now the basic challenge is this. There are roughly three billion people around the world who don't uh, consume much energy, particularly secondary energy like electricity. And so those individuals have not had the opportunity to benefit from the lifestyle and advantages in health and development that we have who have been in societies who have often greater uh, endowments of energy and have used more energy along the way. So that's a very difficult question. So let's start by looking at some data. So here we are, CO2 emissions per capita. We can see the US is uh, not quite at the head of the pack. There are actually other countries that generate more than we do on a per person basis. And there's some slight good news in that these figures are actually down from pre-recession levels when we are actually closer to uh, 20 tons per person. Uh, let's look at the other side of the continuum. You see Africa there at less than one ton per person per year. And actually, that is uh, rather deceptive. Most of the African continent is like less than half uh, a ton per person per year, reflecting their the frank fact that they don't consume much, much energy. So you can see the, the statistics show the European Union uses a, quite a bit of energy, the world average being about four tons per person per year. And then we have China, which in absolute terms is the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases uh, on a per person basis is still far behind uh, the rest of the developed world, but it's growing rapidly. So where do these gases come from? Well, Think about one of the primary ways in which greenhouse gases are created is through fossil fuel consumption for electricity. It's around a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. And again, the US, uh, from these data, is right at the head of the pack. We're using nearly 13,000 kilowatt hours uh, per capita uh, for 2009. Again, you skip to the other end of the continuum here, and you can see Africa is far, far below us in terms of the absolute levels of uh, energy, in this case, electrical energy, that they are able to, to enjoy. Now, if you look carefully at these two charts, you'd notice uh, a couple of things. One is that, in fact, the EU gets more bang for the buck out of their uh, energy because they're more efficient than we are. Uh, and they're certainly more efficient from China. You notice China's bar is a little bit lower here. Well, that's because, in fact, their energy production and consumption is still quite inefficient. So I like to think of the fact that uh, there are various worlds of energy. And this is one way of thinking about the lived experience of individuals in societies that have various levels of both energy use and energy endowment. Because clearly, societies, countries that have lots of energy resources, they're able to take advantage of that in certain ways. So if you go up to the uh, upper right hand uh, uh, square up there, you can see that the US and Canada, for example, we have both 
big endowments of energy, and we use a lot of it, and we are likely to continue using it unless we change our pattern of behavior. On the other hand, you go down to the uh, lower left-hand quadrant, and wow, there is uh, a big chunk of humanity that uh, India, a chunk of Africa that has very little in the way of energy reserve. They might have lots of other minerals, but oil and gas and coal in particular, uh, much of the continent does not have. And then South Asia. So these are low use, relatively low endowment countries that have not benefited from energy and most of their population has not benefited, although uh, probably uh, an elite probably has access to significant energy. So some of the statistics around this particular uh, world of energy are quite alarming. About 1.3 billion people, UN statistics, have no access to electricity. About two and a half billion people use biomass for cooking, and this largely means that they use charcoal, that they uh, have to often go, they get the wood, they create charcoal. It's a very energy intensive process for the individuals. It's very inefficient from an energy perspective. And what does it do? It creates terrible fumes, which uh, basically are harmful to everyone who has to use them, particularly women. So another, another comparison, which I came across looking at some of these data, Look at this. In 2007, the entire continent of Africa used about the same amount of electrical energy that the country of Germany did. Now, since then, Africa has actually increased its electrical generation quite a bit. But nevertheless, you see that this is quite a, a dramatic uh, example of the extent to which energy poverty is really quite a, a significant problem. So this begs another paradox or ethical dilemma. How do we improve living standards and equalize energy use to some extent without blasting the global carbon budget? It's a very difficult question. The good news is that a lot of people have been working on this, and we really do have some ideas about how to go about it. So in particular, uh, lots of NGOs have been creating technologies that provide light and cooking uh, for people at the low end of the uh, uh, use of energy scale so that they can get these energy services uh, very easily without access to the grid. What we need, though, is consistent development aid that can make it possible for us to uh, help the countries and the individuals that need this help obtain uh, these, these services. And there's an estimate that we, if we consistently provided about $15 billion a year in such development aid that we could make uh, quite a, an extensive uh, head, we could make quite a bit of headway on, on this particular issue. Of course, we also need to keep investing in renewable generation and the te technologies behind it so that the countries, particularly around the equator, that are really well placed to take advantage of renewable energy can take advantage of this so that when they make marginal decisions about uh, where they want to generate electricity, it'll be easier for them to choose renewables rather than, in particular, coal or maybe natural gas. So there's another issue, and so if you think about those worlds of energy I described, they don't have an awful lot in common, but there is one thing they hold in common. And that one thing, in fact, is that they all subsidize energy to a, uh, an amazing amount. And most of those subsidies are subsidies to fossil fuels, and the production and use of fossil fuels, often in developing countries, uh, subsidies for gasoline, kerosene, sometimes charcoal. It's a huge amount of money. And if we can help these countries uh, figure out how to cut back those subsidies in sensible ways, uh, that's a win-win for everybody. It enables them to spend less money on energy, often imported energy, which often they have to borrow money to pay for. And it also lowers their climate footprint. So this is an, er an area where a lot of people have been doing a lot of good work, but it's very challenging. For example, uh, there have been countries such as Bolivia and Pakistan, which have uh, made uh, very valiant efforts to try to cut their energy subsidies and do it the right way, and it's caused riots because people become very hooked on, on these energy subsidies. The good news is that if you cut it correctly, you can reduce the amount that these societies spend on energy subsidies and still leave a lot of money left over to help out the people that really need the assistance. The, the amazing statistic is that between 90 and even 95% of the money that countries spend on energy subsidies tends to go to corporations 
and host households that actually don't need them. So if you can find ways to cut these back sensibly, there's still money left over to help the, the individuals who really need the help. Big question, what about the countries such as India and more importantly China that are growing very rapidly and are the primary likely future generators of additional greenhouse gases? Now, so some of the statistics are quite alarming. Uh, if you look at the recent forecasts in terms of who is likely to be generating more energy and more greenhouse gases, you see the OECD here is, uh, meaning the developed countries, likely future uh, demand and production is relatively flat. So most of the excitement, most of the growth is happening uh, in uh, the Asian developing countries. So in particular, the nerve-wracking piece of this uh, puzzle is that world coal use is projected uh, to increase dramatically uh, over the next 20 to 30 years. And this is a real uh, cause for alarm because coal is both dirty and it generates an enormous amount of greenhouse gases. Now, whenever anyone who's a serious energy analyst sees this kind of projection, it makes us a little bit nervous because forecasting in the energy realm is very, very difficult. Uh, forecasts are more likely to be wrong than right. So I'm a little nervous about this being correct. I'm a little bit more hopeful. Here's a picture of uh, Beijing in 2005 uh, in the midst of one of their now even more frequent um, coal inversions and coal smog. Uh, so the one time I was in Beijing, 1995, uh, I had a similar situation. In fact, it was even worse than this. And of course, being a runner, I got up and I went running that morning. And I got back to the hotel and people told me I was crazy. But um, it was really quite remarkable to be out in it and realize that the people in this city were experiencing this on an ever more frequent basis. So when you think about China's situation, uh, think about what they are facing as a society. On the one hand, uh, they have an expectation of future growth which implies that they need to keep increasing their energy generating capacity, mostly for electricity. Uh, that is part of the dynamic that their citizens expect, rising living standards, uh, going, being associated with uh, increased electricity. And they also have this smog to deal with. And the more and more frequent nature of the smog, and you go online, you can see pictures of the entire eastern uh, seaboard of China being covered with dense smog, largely from coal-burning electrical power plants, this is not sustainable. So the leadership in China is really in quite a dilemma. How do they meet all these demands simultaneously? Uh, they're going to have to figure this out. Now, I think this also implies a bigger question, which is the long-standing assumption about the relationship between economic growth, energy use, and human development. And the prevailing sentiment has been, well, you know, we, we develop we're dirty early on, and then we get cleaner, and we get better and healthier as we go along. The problem is that this narrative is not quite so simple. And in fact, there is no linear relationship between carbon consumption and overall living standards. It might appear to be initially, but eventually that falls off. So if you look at the data, again, going back to uh, per capita emissions of CO2 and linking those up by country with their scores on the Human Development Index that the United Nations prepares every year, uh, you can see that there is quite a dramatic leveling off of human development once you get past a particular level, past a certain amount of carbon consumption. So there's the US in the upper right-hand quadrant uh, of this graph. We generate an awful lot of carbon emissions. We use a lot of carbon. What does it get us in terms of our overall quality of life? Relative to a whole lot of countries, and I just chose Sweden to pull out of the mix here, uh, it doesn't get, an, get us an awful lot in terms of our overall quality of health and human development. So, that implies for me that there is significant scope for us to uh, have a very high quality of life while having also a much dramatically reduced level of carbon emission. Now, thinking about where China is and some of the other developing countries on this chart, now in the past, 
what would they have done? They would have kept on migrating up to the upper right-hand quadrant, right? As they developed, as they went through industry and, and got more cars, all those good things that happen with modern industrial development. So our challenge, one of them as a global society, is how to help these countries figure out how to keep on moving upward on this chart for improved overall human development, but also start moving to the upper left-hand quadrant so that they both have higher living standards, but also emit less carbon as they go about it. And this is a big challenge. So when you think about some of the real issues having to do with how do we get to a global agreement which will enable us as a global community to hash out what we can do. And there's one model called uh, basically constriction and convergence, where you gradually constrain the amount that your society is emitting, is using and emitting in terms of fossil fuels and emissions, and will sort of coalesce around one global standard per person. Well, that's going to be a real challenge. Why is that a challenge? Well, it's in part because of what behavioral economists call loss aversion. And loss aversion is a real challenge for in the, the climate change arena because in the US, what's the conversation all about? Well, a lot of it has to do with lost mobility as gasoline becomes more expensive, uh, higher electricity prices, smaller houses. And the conversation, again, is in a domain of loss. What are we going to lose as a result of climate change action? And the conversation in much of the developed world is quite similar with, a, with a, a, an important twist, which is they look at that, they see some of the same issues, and then they say, wow, this also means that we are going to give out, we are going to pass up the opportunity for a significant amount of economic growth, individual development for our citizens, the opportunity for greater life chances. We can't, we simply don't find this acceptable. And oh, by the way, you developed countries, you've been emitting carbon for 200 years. This is your problem. And you've emitted probably 58% of these gases. And now you're telling us that we've got to be part of the solution. So it's a very difficult dynamic. How in the heck do we step aside as a global community and figure out how to bridge this very difficult gap? Uh, for me, one of the answers uh, is around something, again, the behavioral economists talk about. It's called the availability heuristic. How do we make? individual decisions about risk and problems and what we ought to do about them both individually and as a society. Well, often we make these decisions based on our perceptions of uh, what's happening in our own immediate experience. And both good and bad news is that as the reality of climate change starts to hit climate and weather, we're going to start seeing more real evidence of climate change in our daily lives. And my belief is that will eventually lead us to be more willing to take climate change action. And in particular, it will be more easy, it will be easier for us to say, wow, the costs of not acting are really starting to look greater than the costs of acting. That is, there are real benefits to acting now. It will save us a lot of money in the long run. I'm fairly optimistic that eventually we will get to that point as a global community. What I'm hopeful is that we can find ways to do it earlier rather than later. And eventually, we're going to have to think about moving to a global society that is far more reliant on flows of renewable energy and using less fossil fuels. Uh, I believe we can get there, but it's going to take us an awful lot of work. Thanks very much. <laughs>